You found us through fly fishing. You'll stay for our passion and the community. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. Yeah, but he doesn't get it. How come fly fishermen don't get it? You only haul with the short power set. Look for where people walk and the inside the bend and hunt those. The roof blew off and the interior walls got sucked out and the trees are just coming up. And I mean, he's clearly not going to clear the trees. It is not a fly fishing story. It's a story about me trying to understand my brother through fly fishing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor. Waters West Fly Fishing Outfitters is your go-to resource for swung fly techniques, two-handed casting, and anatomous fish. Find out why Waters West has built a cult-like following around their fly time materials and why they are the go-to resource for the OP and beyond. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash waterswest right now to check in with Ed and Kyle and get all geared up to get on the water. Angler's Coffee roasts a full range of coffee with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. With a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Angler's has you covered. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash anglers right now to support a sustainable company with unsurpassed taste. That's Angler's, A-N-G-L-E-R-S. We've been waiting for you. Follow our guests, follow us on Instagram, and share this episode and the love if you enjoy this podcast. And we are live in three, two, one. How you doing, Rick? Hey, hello. Hey. <laughs> Good to have you on here. It's been a little while. We've uh, I looked back in the archives, uh, episode 37, and we're... Uh, we're approaching 500 here uh, this year, so we, we've done quite a bit. It's been, I think, it's been five years, just about five years since we had you on the podcast. Uh, that's that's a long time. Let's uh, we're going to jump into a bunch on entomology and help people understand more about you know kind of the bugs and matching the hatch and stuff like that. But uh, just give us a little update. What have you been up to? I know you were busy be- before. Have you been as busy on kind of all the traveling around and doing events and things like that these days? Uh, pretty darn busy, um, a variety of things as usual and some, uh, fishing trips, of course. Um, mostly I've, I've been doing a lot of, um, work on the Deschutes River with the Deschutes Alliance. I've been on the board for a long time and that's, uh, certainly still ongoing and a lot of activity there. So one of the things that uh, is keeping me busy doing a little bit of consulting work, but, uh, on the fishing side of things, um, I did a really cool program last winter with Phil Rowley, an online course that went for two and a half weeks. And uh, we'll we'll probably do that again this winter. It was in January last year, or this year in January. So hopefully we'll do the same thing this coming January. And and that was a lot of fun. Had a good turnout. So if folks want to find out more about that, keep an eye on my website or Phil Rowley's website. I'm sure we'll be announcing what's happening with that into the uh, late fall season here. They'll be in for Perfect. I remember Phil telling us about that too, because he's he's actually hosting one of our uh, shows on the podcast now, the, the Littoral Zone. Oh, and, cool. Uh, yeah, so we've been, we've been in touch quite a bit, and he mentioned that. So yeah, I think that's awesome. Is there a place people can get that now or is that something where you just open it up to, for for the buying the course during that period right now it was so phil kind of is the the guru when it comes to the technology on that i'm not and uh, i don't think he has it up for sale on the course yet for folks that just want to buy it now that's our hope is to get that set up so folks can do that yeah that's awesome. No, I think that's good. And, I'll, and I'll, we could talk maybe. I'll talk to Phil about it because we've got, I, I mentioned this off air. We've got a, a new course section on the website that we're doing where we're trying to help get some courses up there. So that might be an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So. But mostly just uh, having fun trying to get out on streams and being out on, on the water. Right. 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 Have you been, where have you been fishing kind of equal lakes and rivers or have you been traveling around, you know, just like in Oregon, all around the country? Yeah, I haven't been doing any big 
trips around the country, although I'm taking off in two weeks for a month and I'm going to be hitting Idaho and Montana and Wyoming. Oh, nice. So uh, that's going to be coming up. Um, so this spring uh, and this early summer has been in Oregon and I've been spending more time on lakes really this spring than I have on rivers just for a variety of reasons with the flows and other factors that the rivers haven't been as I <laughs> can do guess to some of the fishing that I've been uh, with, with my timing. So I've been doing a little more lake fishing this spring and I've had some, had some good, good uh, days and some bad days, but uh, I've caught some nice fish on the lakes. I, the thing about the lake fishing is it does give you opportunity to get into some bigger fish, which is always uh, oh, right. entertaining for sure. Yeah. And I haven't the British Columbia uh, lake fishing up there recently, and that's uh, something I've done in the past and want to get back up there because the BC lakes around Kamloops are just, you know, fantastic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, those are still the play. We're, I mean, that's, and we've been talking about that too. We, uh, we've been up there a little bit, um, you know, this last year. What do you, or if you're thinking lakes, do you have places in mind? I mean, there's so many lakes up there. It seems like where do you go? You know, where do you even start? I mean, we've had Brian Chan and Phil both on and talked about this a little bit, but do you have some in mind that you're thinking, like, I'm, I got to hit that lake sort of thing? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to hit, uh, obviously a number of spots, but, uh, kind of on the way out, I'm going to, stop in Idaho and maybe hit the St. Joe. And, um, and I always enjoy the locks. I'll probably have my way back and yeah, probably in early September, I would hit the locks. I, I love that stream in Idaho. And, uh, I have some friends in Hamilton on the bitter root. So I'm open to stop in, in Hamilton and fish the bitter root a little bit. And then, um, heading over to Eastern Montana and maybe fish the big horn some, and a uh, couple of streams of friend in you know, lives over near the big horn has a couple of spots in Wyoming that I've never been to, uh, that he's mentioned as potentially some pretty interesting, some type streams. So I'm not sure where I'm going to end up in Wyoming. There you go. Yeah. One place I've fished in Wyoming in the past that I just love is around Saratoga, uh, Wyoming, which is kind of straight north of Fort Collins. Beautiful areas, then, and, and the Encampment River there is is just an amazing food factory. I've I've rarely cl- seen a stream with so many bugs in it. It's just absolutely phenomenal. Right, and you guys aren't going through. We've been doing a lot, like in the Henry's Fork and South Fork Snake. You're not going to be in that part of the country. I I don't have plans to get there, but you never know on my way back where I might end up. Right, right. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So the Bitterroot, well, I'm interested because we, we actually did an episode on the St. Joe this uh, not too long ago um, with uh, Derek Darce. We talked about, so it sounds like a really cool river and maybe it's far enough out of the way that you don't get as much pressure as some right. of these other rivers. But, um, and the Bitterroot too, that's one that, you know, I haven't fished, but I've thought about what, is, when you go into these rivers, just thinking about getting ready, you know, maybe on your end and some of this, you might already know so much that it's easier, but how do you... How do you prepare for these and how would somebody listening prepare for the trips? You know, when you think about, you know, kind of hatches and things like when you think, yeah. say, the bitter root. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I think the main thing is kind of know what the water levels are going to be like and what kind of conditions you're going to run into. So it's really handy now. You can go online and check, you know, water levels easily with USGS gauges around. And, and that's going to give you a really good idea of what kind of, um, Oh, conditions you're going to be fishing in, whether you're going to be real low and real clear and water's warm. So, you know, that's the case you're going to looking at morning and evening kind of fishing and afternoon might be kind of quiet unless, of course, hopper fishing could be good in the summer. So, you know, and there might even be hoot owl restrictions now where you can fish in the middle of the afternoon. So that's one of the main things you really want to be up on is what are the river conditions and temperatures these days. And, and one thing that I'd never ever thought about in 20 years ago is just what the fire conditions are right. in an area. And nowadays that's one of the big factors in deciding where you're going to go is where's bad smoke conditions and you don't want to be hanging out in. So obviously that's something that's not related to what you're going to be fishing. Yeah. But, but important, um, as in terms of fishing, you know, I'm, I'm focused on trout, so my gear doesn't really change that much. I'm typically fishing a three-weight, four-weight, or a five-weight, you know, depending on what I'm fishing. And I'll, I'll have those, kind of those are the three rod sizes I like to take. 
And then in terms of hatches, I, I'm pretty familiar with the range of hatches I'm going to potentially run into uh, different seasons. And, you know, the fly boxes, I think a lot of people have and I have, usually have pretty good coverage of kind of caddis you're going to run into in the summer. You know, 16s, the, the 12s for caddis is the primary sizes you'd want. One of my favorite consistent nymph patterns for caddis is a green rock worm nymph pattern for caddis is consistently productive uh, throughout the West and even in the Midwest and East. You know, it covers a lot of the dominant caddis that you run into. And uh, for mayflies, they change, I think, quite a bit uh, with season. And so you kind of have to um, almost go case by case on what stream you're in and what might be happening because of the elevation you're at and the, the temperatures and just what that stream tends to have in it for mayfly hatches. That, that I find those a lot more variable than you might run into with cat. Yeah. That's right. So you got the mayflies, and that's the thing. You got all these hatches of mayflies, and then caddis seem to be, depending on where you're at, like, you know, they're out there, they're around. So does caddis seem like it's a little more straightforward as far as the patterns you're picking? I mean, I think of some of these dry patterns, dry flies specifically. You know, you yeah. got the old elk hair caddis, but I mean, what does what your dry fly box look like for caddis? Yeah. One I've been using a lot is called the CDC and elk. And uh, gosh, what is the book? It was in a book. Uh, tying dry flies, um, but uh, I can't remember the book right now, but it's a great pattern. It just uses one CDC feather for the body and hackle, and then in the deer hair kind of tied on like a elk hair caddis, um, but no hackle. And it floats well, but I fish a lot of dry caddis subsurface. Oh, okay. A lot of the caddis that we have dive underwater to lay their eggs. And so um, the CDC and elk pattern uh, works great as a dry, but also if you tug it underwater, put a little split shot on your leader and sink it, it looks really good underwater, traps bubbles of air with the CDC, and it's really effective either as a wet fly or as a dry fly. Mm-hmm. And I really like patterns that are flexible like that that you can use in a variety of ways. Um, and that's definitely one of my favorites for caddis for dries. Caddis pupa, I don't do anything fancy. Um, I use pupa patterns a lot. A dry dropper with a dry caddis and a pupa pattern as a dropper is another go-to thing that I do a lot uh, when there's caddis out. Or I swing caddis pupa and let them sink and then um, uh, swing them up to the surface is the other great way to to caddis pupa. Uh, But you do want to get them at some depth before you start rising them to the surface. So a bead head or a little split shot on the leader is great. And that, that's usually evening activity, you know, especially in the summer, caddis activities right there in the last, you know, hour to right up to dark is uh, when that activity tends to peak uh, during the day. But the other thing with caddis is don't, don't ignore them during the middle of the day. If you, you walk down to a stream and you're walking along at the, the bank and there's grass and trees and you see caddis flying out, um, they get blown in by the wind, just like grasshoppers get blown by the wind. And you can fish a dry caddis pattern midday, just fish the water uh, without any hatch activity going on, just as a searching pattern, and do quite well at times. So don't ignore caddis dry flies, even if there's no hatch going on uh, or active egg laying happening, if you see adults along the bank, because they get blown in. Nice. Yeah, that's a good tip. And what is the, on the pupa, what, what, what sort of pattern, what are you using there for that one? Oh gosh, I, I don't even know if I have a name for it. It's just, you know, down the device and tie it. I, I just tie, you know, mostly I'm tying, um, I'll tell you what I use a lot are flimp patterns. Oh yeah. It's the classic flimp, uh, which is like a soft hackle, right? Uh, just the variation of a soft hackle and I'll put a bead on it. And, um, I use those as much as anything for pupa patterns. And the other reason I really like those flies is they're again, great searching patterns. Uh, when there's no activity, hatch activity, and you don't see fish rising and you maybe don't want to nymph fish or you're tired of nymphing, uh, put on a soft tackle and swing soft tackles in the tail outs of riffles or in choppy water. And it's amazing how well those will work. Right, right. That's awesome. And and that's just your typical, yeah, swinging like downstream and across, fishing the swing sort of thing. 
Exactly. Exactly. And in Arcadis, I mean, I think you hear about the mayflies, right? Depending on elevation, temperatures, and all that stuff. But Arcadis, pretty much everywhere, you know, do you, on all these Western streams you're going to, are you going to find caddis or where would you not find caddis? Well, you will find caddis everywhere. Caddis are a very diverse order with actually more species out there than there are mayflies. And there's uh, a species adapted to all types of stream conditions. Uh, whether you're in a high mountain stream that's super cold, or if you're in a valley stream with more silty, finer substrate and warmer conditions, there's going to be caddis there. There's caddis species that are adapted to even quite warm water, where you might even have thermal springs. Uh, there's going to be caddis species. So the caddis are much more widespread and diverse, really, in their presence than mayflies would be. So yeah, caddis are going to be yep. found everywhere. They're everywhere. And, and there are some big differences in caddis hatches between the East Coast and the Western states. Uh, they get a number of caddis out there in the spring, early summer, that we don't see more case caddis than we might uh, think about here in the West. But uh, but still, caddis, caddis are widespread and, and, and very uh, tough trout's diet. They're everywhere. Do trout on the case caddis, are, are they eating, are, are those case caddis getting eaten at all? They definitely are. Um, yeah, no question about it. I've done a lot of stomach samples on fish for, for work-related projects where they've gone out and electrofish trout, and then I've sat down and done a lot of stomachs. Um, and there's no question that they, they eat case caddis. It's not as frequent as the free-floating locals, you know, would be eaten. But uh, certainly they do pick them off the bottom on purpose. They do. That's interesting. Yeah. Nice. So, so yeah, so you're getting ready for this trip and you know, I mean, obviously you've, and we haven't even talked about, but you've got, you know, a number of books. I mean, we can go back on the first episode, episode 37, we talked about your background, your history and, you know, Western Hatches was one of the first books that I remember. And you back way back in the day with my dad back in the shop, even did some some clinics, you know, like okay. how long ago? That was probably in the eighties, right? Or something like that. It, it was, it was in the eighties. Yeah. yeah. The eighties. Yeah. It's amazing. So, and, um, but you have Western hatches and you have a number of books. I mean, I think probably just send people out to rickhafley.com to take a look at your books. And is that the best place to go? Yeah. My website, rickhafley.com is the best place to go. And, uh, I've got the most recent book that's out. It's not a book really. It's a pamphlet. It's just my favorite fly patterns and how to fish them. And, and you can pick that up on Amazon. You can order it directly off of Amazon or from me if you want a signed copy. But yeah, it, it's on my website too. So Nice. So was that hard to write your favorite fly patterns? It seems like there's so many patterns. How do you choose? What do you, did you choose a certain number? Yeah, there's, there's like 15 patterns in there. So it's pretty pared down to just kind of the essentials. There's like, you know, five dry flies, five wet flies, five nymphs kind of thing, you know. And, uh, but they're ones that I, you know, don't leave home without them kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. could, they could work everywhere. East coast, West coast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. And your background, you know, you know, we talked about this on the other one, but yeah, you have, you know, your background, maybe you can describe that a little bit, a quick little summary. You have a, a degree in what yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Go into that a little bit. So people know where you're coming from. Sure. Sure. Well, I, I ended up, uh, getting into fly fishing when I was young, like 12 years old. And where was that? Where did you grow up again? Well, that was in Illinois. Okay. That was in Illinois. I grew up in a little farm town in Illinois. So that was, you know, going out the farm ponds and little creeks around the area. But I got into fly fishing at an early age. Started tying flies, ordered stuff out of herders, uh, which if anybody's old enough, yeah, they'll remember herders. But that, like, it goes back a long time. But uh, so my fascination, I guess, with rivers and what lived in them started at early times. And um, when I graduated from high school, I, I wanted to I wanted to see big western rivers. I had I'd seen enough stuff on you know TV and read fly fishing magazines and stuff. So I I went to uh, Bellingham to my undergraduate work in Bellingham. And while I was in Bellingham, I was just majoring in general biology and fly fishing around Bellingham, Washington, uh, which has some you know really epicenter of some great steelhead fishing and sand fishing and some good you know, fishing and uh, was kind of deciding, trying to decide what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And, and uh, the the head of the biology department there 
Jerry Kraft was his name, Dr. Kraft. He uh, he had gotten his PhD studying stoneflies at Oregon State University. And he taught an aquatic entomology class when I was a senior. And I was the only person who signed up for the course. And he and he went ahead and taught taught it so I'd get together. He was a great guy. So he and I <laughs> spent a, a term talking about aquatic insects and stuff. And, and he kind of was a good mentor and got me really interested in going to grad school in aquatic insects. That's uh, so why I went to Oregon State. And uh, so I got my degree there in aquatic entomology and fortunately got a job uh, working on water quality issues on uh, looking at aquatic insects at a time when that was a rising interest around the country. And EPA spent a lot of effort trying to get more states involved in that. So I I had a a perfect timing to actually study aquatic insects after I got out of grad school. And the fishing thing, of course, was going on at the same time. Today's episode is sponsored by Stonefly Nets, putting quality before quantity with their handcrafted custom wood landing nets. Charleston, South Carolina native Ethan Eigelhart was bitten by the fly fishing bug in 2014 and shortly thereafter started Stonefly Nets. He now lives in the trout rich waters of the Ozarks and handcrafts some of the sweetest wooden landing nets you'll see. I've been using these Stonefly Nets for quite a while now and I'm excited to dig into another year. Ethan builds these nets custom, and you can select from four sizes and many different wood options. For Ethan, fly fishing is a memory created from a morning on a beautiful stretch of water casting a three-weight bamboo rod that his grandmother gave to his father, and then he passed to Ethan. Ethan is helping us create the same types of lasting memories every time we're on the water with these classic custom wood nets. You can head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to check out your custom net right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to stonefly. Okay, back to the show. So do you find, I mean, that's the thing, you got the two things, you got the water quality that's going on and you've got the fishing out there that's obviously, do they... Do they align? Like, what, what do you, I mean, they must just overlap. You know, a lot of the stuff you do overlaps. What, what do you find is, like, for the DRA stuff, right, you've got some of that going. Do you find that um, there's a lot of differences? Are you learning a lot that's helping with you with your fishing through the stuff you're doing with the DRA and all that other stuff? Well, I guess I would have to say yes. I mean, I've, I've been lucky, right? My job and my, and my interest in fishing has just put me out there on streams a lot. and And I think uh, above all else, right, is the amount of time you spend observing what's going on and seeing what's going on firsthand is maybe the most important thing in terms of learning about fishing and, and better success. So I've, I've seen it all over the West and intensely studied a lot of streams in Oregon, your different seasons. And so I think all of that factors into one's kind of connection with what's going on it's the observing yeah that's the thing that keeps yeah. coming up a lot yeah is that's the, yeah. the more observation you do the the better you, you know the more you're going to learn right well i think one of the things that beginning fly fishermen clearly struggle with is what fly do you put on and you walk out to a stream and you're going to start fishing it's like what in the hell do you use and and there's the choices are endless well and and so i think experience we all in time gravitate to a certain group of fly patterns that we've had success with in the past and i think the other problem people run into is they get in a rut they know you know geez the prince nymph sure has worked for me in the past so i'm going to put it on and that's fine uh and that's not a bad (laughs) at all thing but if that prince nymph isn't working that day how do you decide what else to use and and i think having some knowledge about the food that fish are eating and what's living in the stream, the insects that are out there is the best way to base your decisions, you know, on how you're going to proceed when something you're doing isn't working. Right. Yeah. I love that. I love that you went into this because this is, this is the big part of it. And, you know, I struggle with that. I think everybody, and that could be your home stream or, you know, you're going to some new stream and you could always call fly shops and things like that and they can help you out, but it's still the same thing. They're going to tell you some stuff and they're going to tell you some flies, but at the end of the day, you're going to be on that stream and you got to figure things out on your own. So what would be the first, let's take that through kind of a step-by-step there. What would be, you know, you're on the river, you know, yeah. what, 
yeah, how, describe that. How do you get somebody prepared to be ready when that Prince Nip isn't working? Yeah, well, here's kind of what I tell people when I do workshops and stuff. Is so you you go out there in the morning, you're gonna start fishing. You've got a fly pattern in mind. You put it on. I said, you know, people want to fish. They 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 need to get out there. So put on the fly pattern you gravitate to for whatever reason. It worked yesterday or a month ago, and fish for yeah half an hour, an hour. And and if you're not having good success, then it's time to put your rod down and really do a little bit of observation of what's going on out there. And so that could mean just simply walking over some alders along the bank and shaking the leaves, see what flies out. Have you been seeing swallows in the air? You know, there's swallows flying around. Maybe it's midges or maybe it's a spinnerfall mayflies up there. And so really start zeroing in on some actions that are happening around you that relate to what the fish might be feeding on. And then just spend 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, picking up some rocks from a riffle and seeing what dominant insects are crawling around, you know, and you don't have to get out there with a net and, you know, into it in a deep, deep way, but a little time just picking up a few stones and rocks and seeing, you know, what's on them. And you don't need to know the Latin names, but it helps to know that, you know, oh, this is a caddis larva and it's going to not be a swimmer and it's just going to drip, you know, movement. Oh, and here's a blue winged olive mayfly nymph. It's a fast swimmer. A little bit of information like that can help. But then just pick some patterns that um, relate to what you're seeing on those gravel and rocks you're picking up. And it's going to give you more confidence. You're going to have a little more likelihood of having something on the fish you're seeing and are tuned into. And then fish another hour and keep track of how many fish you catch. And typically, you're going to be doing better. It'll improve your confidence that that 20 minutes you spent observing was worth it. And it gives you a little more understanding of what's going on. And it's going to change during the day. If you're out there at eight in the morning, something different is going to be happening at two in the afternoon. And again, at eight in the evening, it's what worked in the morning isn't what you're going to be using in the evening. So these things change throughout the day. Again, don't get in a rut just because I worked two hours ago and all of a sudden you're not catching fish sit down start thinking about it and observe what's happening and you know there's no silver bullets that's always going to work but it gives you an improvement in your chances of, of something work that's it yeah and then and then going to your fly box so and I, you know, i think of that you pick up the rock you see some caddis some case caddis you see some mayflies maybe some clingers whatever you kind of get about the right size. Maybe you can even pick it up and look at the coloration. Is that all, whatever you can get on your Intel. And then you look at your fly box and say, okay, here's a size 16 bluing, whatever. Yeah. And what I really like folks to do in in the workshop that really kind (laughs) of makes them realize uh, that their flies are typically too big is if you can pull, you know, just take a couple of the bugs you're seeing that are dominant on the rocks and put them in just a little dish of water, right? It could be just old jar lid or something you have in your vest put a little bit of water in there and put the bugs in there and then drop your flies in next to them you'll be shocked at how big a size 14 nymph is next to a natural right typically they look huge next to a natural yeah and i think size if the fish are at all being selective if you're in a you're in a productive stream like a lot of our streams are in the west uh the fish do become fairly uh, selective if you're in a mountain stream that's not as productive, like I, I floated the middle fork of the salmon three, four years ago. It was COVID, so I guess it's four years ago. Now. And and it's a dry fly, you know, the whole time you're floating, you're fishing dry flies and a lot of attractor patterns. And I did my typical bug sampling out there when I'm, you know, out there. And it is not a productive stream. It comes out of a wilderness area. It's beautiful water. It's clean. Everything about it is pretty pristine, but just the natural geology does not produce very productive water there. There are not a lot of insects in that water. And so those trout in the middle fork of the salmon are looking for anything they can eat. And so they're not selective. And and so putting on an attractor dry fly works just great. But if you're in the Henry's fork, in a totally different situation, And so the trout there are going to be very selective and you really need to know what they're feeding on and size becomes really important 
you know, if they're taking an 18 and you put on a 16, you're going to get refusals. So that's where you put your fly next to the natural and we'll really look at it. Size, we're almost always putting on flies that are too big. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably a good rule of thumb is whatever fly you think go a size down or two below that. Yeah. Typically we hate to go down below an 18. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, me too. <laughs> Yeah, I've never been a big fan of the size twenties and all that small stuff. Although yeah. people definitely do use them, so well, yeah. At times, that's what you need to do. Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, so yeah, so this gives us a little in your workshops that you would do. These would be where you'd go out to a stream, you'd have a group of people, and you'd just kind of walk through kind of what we're doing, but on the stream, showing people turnover rocks. You know, kind of what are the, what other things would you be talking about there in those workshops that you know you get people ready. Yeah, so I've, I've been doing workshops on the Deschutes and Moppin for 30 years over there, and usually one or two every spring uh, with John Smaralio. And uh, so what we do is the morning is a indoor session where I go through slides and talk about all the different uh, major hatches. And then in the afternoon, uh, we go out on the stream, collect insects, look at them, give people a firsthand uh you know, view what they look like alive and talk about how to recognize them again, put fly patterns next to them and talk about what patterns would work for which uh, or insect hatch. And then we go through a series of instruction on rigging and fishing dries, soft tackles, emergers, and and nymph fishing. And so uh, it's a pretty complete, you know, overview of just about everything in terms of matching hatches and fishing techniques and then we go through in about an eight hour day so one day you cover basically cover all and then people are fishing that evening yeah afterwards they they we don't do any like guiding and fishing during the day but when they're done with the course they're on the river and go out and fish all they want gotcha nice I noticed on your website you had, I was looking at some of your course, um, I think it was some of the courses, but it was like five mistakes to avoid or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Talk about that. Maybe, maybe talk about some of those mistakes that you have in that, uh, in that book or that information there. And then what else you have on your site, you know, how it's set up. Yeah. That's a great, uh, question and good program. I think is, uh, touched on one of them is, um, don't get stuck doing the same thing over and over. It's not working. And, and, uh, it's it's common for folks just because they believe in whatever fly pattern they have it on is the pattern and they they just keep fishing and if you're not catching fish you need to change something and so that's one thing is is stay aware of what's happening and and be ready to change what you're doing if it's not working the other mistake is is what i call rootitis and it is with nymph fishing is that people will be just staying in one spot, like in a 10 foot area and they fish that for an hour and, you know, they haven't been catching fish and they're just standing there over and over and fishing the same water. And it doesn't happen as much with dry fly fishing, but with nymph fishing, I see it routinely. And so I always uh, mention, you know, keep moving, you know, look next to holding lie and they get an eight or nine good drifts through it then move to the next holding spot you know it might be 10 feet out it might be 15 feet above you but kind of keep working the water as you're fishing those nymph patterns and uh, you just need to keep getting your fly in front of fish you know if you've powdered an area the fish either aren't taking it or you've scared them away so uh, you got to keep moving Right. How do you get that when you're, you got that whole thing like we're talking about. So you, you got the fly you think works is working, but then maybe you don't catch a fish. Yeah, well, I guess that's it. You fish it for eight. And then when do you end up switching the fly, right? How do you know when you're. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll, if I'm nymph fishing, I'll work through a run, say it's a run of 200 feet. Long. And maybe it takes me 30, 45 minutes to work through that run. And if I've done well, then I feel like I'm dialed in. If I haven't done well, I'm going to change something and it might just be putting on more weight. Maybe I'm getting deep enough, you know? And so I've gone through a run and gone back to the bottom, put on another split shot, worked up and, you know, tripled the number of fish I caught just by putting one more split shot. Or, or I'll set the rod down, do some kicks in the river and look at what bugs are there and it'll change my idea what nymph pattern I should be using. And I'll change nymph pattern and uh, try something in a different uh, style of fly pattern. So, you know, that's that's the 
kind of what I would end up doing. And, and, um, you know, you go to a different section of river, a quarter of a mile away, half a mile away, probably the same flies would be likely to be still working, but maybe not. Uh, maybe you're in a different substrate. Maybe it's bigger rock and a bigger cobble than where you were just at. So you're going to have a different type of insect uh, dominating in a different substrate condition. So, you know, then be ready to change what you're using because it might need to be different. Yeah, because it's always changing, like you said, throughout the day. And if you find something in, you know, let's just take, say you're on the Deschutes, you hit something at 10 a.m. and it's just on, and then, you know, by 12, it's off. The next right. day, all things equal, do you expect that hatch to be there again at 10 a.m.? You do. Yeah, absolutely. But don't be surprised when it's not. Yeah, but no, you would definitely kind of hope and expect it, it would be there the next day as well. The weather is going to obviously be a factor. Generally speaking, overcast days are going to be, you know, more conducive to better hatches or surface activity than a bright sunny day. Yeah. Why is that? Why is that? that the, is that just, um, yeah, why are the overcast better for the bugs, the bug hatches? Well, I, I think it affects the fish and the bugs. So the bugs are, the, the adult aquatic insects, whether it's a mayfly, cat, a snowfly, uh, they're very prone to dehydration. Uh, just anything that's small has a very big surface area to volume. So all insects have to deal with um, being deep and losing much water. And terrestrial insects have mastered that by having a hard exoskeleton. Oh, right. Like what would the type of bug that be? What would that be? Well, like a beetle. You beetle, you've got you know a real hard shell on it. And it doesn't lose water uh, from evaporation. Aquatic insect adults that are flying around uh, don't have those hard exoskeletons like terrestrial insects. So they're very prone to dehydration. So they are going to have better survival when the sun isn't bright and it's not, you know, really conditions that are going to dry them out so quickly. Now, how do the nymphs know that? Well, they're certainly sensitive to light intensity. So I think, you know, in general, the nymphs are reacting more to those low light conditions and evolved over time that, you know, more adults survive when they merge on those low light days than survive on bright sunny days. So over time, it's just probably pushed the evolution to more activity on those overcast days. Oh, that's cool. God, there's so much going on. That's the cool thing about the entomology having you on here because, you know, you could start really, keep it basic. I think it's probably if you're new to it, keep it basic. But as you, as you keep evolving and learning, you, you realize like, I mean, do you still feel after all your years of this and your degrees and everything that you still, uh, are you close to mastering everything or do you still have some stuff to learn? Uh, not even close. No, I, I, I think for me, you know, the fly fishing is fascinating just from the action of fly fishing and fly casting, tying flies. I mean, that's great stuff. And you can spend a lot of time learning and mastering that, but the uh, but the biology side of it with the insects is what's really always kept me so interested in fly fishing and and there's never opportunity to learn everything about all the insects. I mean, it, it's there's just too much. Yeah, too many bugs. Just like you said with the beetles, right? There's uh, how many different species of beetles and all all these things, right? Yeah, I mean, beetles make up two-thirds of all living things on the planet oh wow and beetles so that's so cool well let, let's go back let's finish up that five mistakes to avoid so you mentioned yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah don't so, get stuck and don't get rooted uh rootitis what, what else you got there and then the other one i've touched on with nymphing is you're not getting deep enough make sure what then you get to the bottom if you're nymph fishing and uh if you're not uh you're not feeling the bottom uh, like every three or four casts. If you don't feel your fly tick the bottom, you're not getting hung up on a rock, you know, every four, five or six casts. You're not probably deep enough if you're truly wanting to fish the bottom. And so put on a little more weight. And, you know, of course, we can maybe dive into a little bit of here on Euro nymphing now. So talking about it, uh, Euro nymphing is really caught on out here west. I think it has everywhere. I don't know if you had somebody on the podcast. Yeah, we well, we've got taken the next level. So we've had uh, definitely, you know, Devin, lots of the big Euronymph, but we've also um, set up a, a trip out to the Henry's Fork and uh, and the South Fork of the Snake with Pete Erickson. So we're doing a big trip in uh, in October. Yeah, so this is part of the thing we're learning, and it's going to be all Euro. So Pete's going to 
teach us how to do the euro niffing how and he's the you know he's on the uh he's got some yeah. medals and all that stuff on the team yeah well that's great because euro nymphing is certainly productive and and effective and i'm i'm still on the learning curve with euro nymphing for sure and and kind of trying to refine my <laughs> skill it, it is radically different than typical nymphing or fly fishing so the, it's yeah everything about it is quite different but the reason it's effective and what i just kind of my general take on nymph fishing is the things that you want to be able to do nymph fishing is you need to get your fly to the depth the fish are at and with nymphing that's generally right along the bottom and your nymphing does a great job of that you want your fly to drift naturally so it looks natural in the water column drift euro nymphing does a great job of that and you need to be able to detect a strike when it happens and if you can do those three things you're going to catch fish no matter what you're using or technique you're using if you get the fly to the right depth you get a natural drift and you can detect the strike you're going to catch fish and and euro nymphing is just very efficient at all three of those and and but i've i've had a great success over the years you know using an indicator typical nymph fishing rig or tight line nymphing without an indicator as well uh so you don't have to euro nymph i mean people kind of maybe get in the frame of mind now oh god i'm not euro nymphing i can't catch fish no that's ridiculous the other nymphing techniques still work quite well but euro nymphing is so efficient at those three things that it it is a great technique yeah that, that's right Nice. So, and, and we might talk a little about your setups too on your terminal tackle, but so we got the, and so we got on the five here, we got the deep, um, deep enough. Yeah. Get not. What are the four, the other two? The other one is, uh, make sure your flies are not too large. I call them. And, and we touched on that earlier, but, uh, especially with nymph fishing again, people tend to think bigger is better. And this is a great example as fishing. I talked about the encampment river in Wyoming. I was fishing that years ago, giving a program there. I went out fishing the next day and that river uh, stream is loaded. It had green drake nymphs, like just gobs up, add salmon fly nymphs. It had really large caddis, all these big nymphs out there that were just phenomenal numbers. And we went out uh, the next day, it was in early April, there wasn't any hatch, so we're nymphing. And we had on like a salmon fly and a green drake nymph, you know, drifting along, not doing squat, you know, really slow. Put on a size 18 blue-winged olive nymph and just start catching fish after. So, you know, here are all these big nymphs out there. You're thinking, God, the fish got to be wanting those, those big flies. But no, they want a size 18 little mayfly nymph. And, and so don't be afraid to put on a f- small nymph pattern and, and fish it. Um, it, it is so often that that works better than the big ones. And now then there's streamers, fishing streamers and stuff where you put on big flies and, you know, you're going to catch big fish. So, you know, there's a whole nother genre of approach that way too. But when you're out there nymphing and you're, you know, really in trout water like that, don't be afraid to put on a small nymph pattern. Yeah. That, and I always think of the, the big patterns, think of the salmon fly hatch. So you got this giant, these giant bugs Right. And nymphs. And I guess maybe that's the same thing. You could probably catch some fish and small stuff there as well, right? Well, during the salmon fly hatch on the Deschutes, there's a small caddis, size 18, the little saddle case caddis that's very prevalent the same time of year. And often there's days where a little size 18 pupa is going to fish a salmon fly nymph. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. And and so did we cover that last, the fifth uh, bullet there on the mistakes to avoid? Um, I think we did. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I'm trying now. to remember. If we didn't, we'll uh, we'll circle back around. We'll send people out to your. Um, well, let's see. Now we're can we're looking at this uh, kind of the programs and five mistakes you don't need to make. Yeah. And where are these things? So those are programs that I generally give the as program talks to fly fishing clubs. Oh yeah. Gotcha. Or if a fly shop you know has me come in a day or or part of a day. Okay. So this might be something maybe we could uh, in longer term maybe work with you on to put something together maybe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And get a group of people interested, which 
which I feel like this is a, a very, it's one of those things where I think myself, I mean, I've been thinking about this my whole life pretty much. And still, I'm not even close to, you know, any sort of level that I want to be at. So it feels like it's always, you know, the anatomy of a trout stream. I'm just going through some of these, you know, yeah. you talk about caddis, the four seasons of fly fishing. I mean, there's a bunch of topics here that are really interesting. Understanding emergers, you know, emergers is one of those, you know, I guess, what do you call that? A category um, yeah. that, that yeah. just gets left back, right? You feel like you got the nymphing, like you said, you're nymphing, you got dries everybody loves, you got the big streamers, but why is it that emergers are left kind of in the, they're like the, uh, you know what I mean? They're, they're in the background. Yeah. Well, it's that in between stage of what the insect is doing. And it's a bit of a mystery what's happening at that point. And I think people get confused and don't understand the behavior of the insects that's happening then. So they really don't know what kind of fly pattern to put on when fish aren't taking the dry fly uh, that you would typically put on like a parachute atoms or, you know, PMD pattern, whatever, dry stone fly. They're not taking that typical dry fly, but they're feeding on the surface, right? And it's driving you nuts because you see fish feeding and they're rising right next to your fly. You know, and you see the bugs that they're taking on the surface, but they're not taking a dry fly. So it's that mystery of what, what is it that they're doing and what fly pattern really represents that. And so those are the emerger patterns. And there's been, you know, a long string uh, and history of emerger patterns that are out there to use, but you need to know how to fish them and when to, when to use them. And so that's kind of what that emerger program dives into in detail. And it's one of my you know, more favorite. It's one of the more I ask for programs that I have because it is something people get frustrated with and want to know, you know, what to do. Um, and I, I enjoy the giving that program, but yeah. So, and mayflies are going to be different than caddisflies and caddisflies and mayflies are different than midges, you know, comes to emerging. So, you know, you want to have some tools, both your patterns and techniques available when you see that going on. Yeah. Um, if if you have just a few things that you know you can do, it's going to make a world of difference. And so, uh, mostly, I'd say it's in the fly patterns that you're going to change to uh, when they're taking something in the surface, but not the dry fly. You're going to fish type of pattern that match that insect that's in the process of changing from a nymph to an adult, gotcha. or a pupa to an adult. Are you fishing those, you know, I always think of the wet, you know, swinging the wet fly with a, an emerger sort of thing, but can you fish those in all sorts of habitats, pools? Like if you're fishing there, they're in a, say you're in a pool, are you fishing, could you fish an emerger there too? Absolutely. In fact, I'd say like pools or slow water, big eddies and stuff where it's slow is where I run into midges in streams and you want to put on an emerger pattern with pupa right in the fill, right? Um, you're fishing it basically as an emerger. And midges, since they're prevalent insects in pool habitat, uh, would be one of the things you'd commonly run into. There. But, you know, depending on the stream and general water characteristics, you could have things drifting from the faster water down into a pool and really seeing fish taking emergers in the pool, even though insects are coming from the water upstream. Gotcha. So you could fish a some sort of a um, whatever a, a caddis emerger or yeah, caddis pupa, a mayfly emerger, a quigley emerger. Yep. Um, you know things like that in in pool if that's. But usually when you're fishing emergers, you're seeing fish rising. Not always, but usually you're seeing fish rising. So wherever that's happening, you know uh, it could be a riffle, a run, pool. If you're seeing fish actively feeding, and you can't catch them on your dry fly then you're really looking at going to an emerger type of pattern. So that's it. So if you're, if fish are feeding to say there's a mayfly hatch coming off or, or caddis and you just can't get them and you think you have the right size, it might be a good move to move to try an emerger, get, go below the surface a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Below the surface bit or just right in the film. I use a little CDC pattern just uh, for mayflies. Like blue winged olives are a great example because they're such a frequent hatch. Fish are often taking them as emergers instead of a dry fly. So I just did like a size 18, a little dubbing on the hook uh, that was the color, right color. And I just put a little CDC on the thorax and it, and then at, it pull it over like a wing case uh, on the thorax. And it'll float right in the film. 
And, and the thing is, you're going to fish it dead drift, just like a dry fly. You're going to fish it to fish you see rising like a dry fly, but it's floating right flush in the film. And it's really hard to see it because it's a little tiny fly and it's not sticking up above the water. So you're just watching where your leader is on the surface and waiting, you know, sort of a little surface rise where you expect your fly to be. Uh, and generally you're in fairly soft current so you can see the fish rise and uh it, it's very effective very very effective right 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 that's an awesome tip i was thinking about resource you know just about you know this right we're not going in deep to all the life history the life cycle of these bugs but we're you know i know you've got a lot of information but where would you send somebody if they're listening now and they're thinking man i would love to learn more about the life history of a mayfly or even how right it hatches where, where would you direct somebody where, where could somebody learn about that more that we can't cover today well, there's a lot of books out there. I mean, yeah, you know, for mayflies, the book Dave and I did on mayflies, Western mayfly hatches is great. Um, there's a book on caddis that actually Tom Ames Jr. did on Eastern caddis flies. And it's the best book on caddis since LaFontaine did his book on caddis. It's on Eastern caddis fly hatches. But the biology information in there he has and the fishing information he has in there is um, excellent, uh, no matter where you're fishing caddis. And so the specifics of when things hatch and stuff would be different out west. But uh, his patterns and techniques and biology behavior he talks about is great, no matter where you're fishing. And um, that's one of the best books I've seen on caddis out there. Thomas Ames, Jr., and I don't know the name of the book. It's Eastern Caddis Flyers. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put a, we'll get a link in the show notes so people can take a look at that one. Yeah. It's a great book. And, and then ours on Mayflies for Western Mayflies is really thorough and dives into the weeds on Mayflies. And there's so much information online now. I'm not, I'm not a, you know, I'm old enough that I, I'm not plugged into all the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, Dave, you probably know way more stuff than I do. What's out? There. Well, that, that's the one thing I, I, you know, I think we've talked to a lot of people, and I, and I know we have some people, and I've had guests on that have talked. I'm sure you've heard of. They yep. have talked about it, but it, it yeah. seems like that not not as many are have master's degrees in entomology. You know what I mean? I think that yeah. some of it's not quite. And I feel like, uh, yeah, I mean, you still are a great resource. I mean, I'm just looking at your books here, like even Western Hatches going back. Yeah, that was it's not, now you have Western. So there's Western Mayfly hatches, and then there's the, the Western hatches, right? Which was that your original book? What was the fir- that first one? Yeah, that was the first book that I did, and with Dave Hughes, of course. Yeah, and that's a complete book of Western hatches, which came out in 1981. Yeah, eighty. Wow, so eighty one. And so if somebody was to pick that book up, or if they had on forty years shelf, ago, <laughs> there, yeah, is that still? I mean, is it all still valid? Everything there, pretty much. Yeah, the entomology information is valid. But, uh, you know, um, the fly patterns have changed. Oh, yeah. You know, what's commonly used now is different. Yeah. And it's all in black and white with just a few color plates. Right. So nowadays, it would look old because books are all in color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's what, So the Western Mayfly hatches would definitely be a, a upper level from that. So, yeah, so we'll have a link out. And this is just, you can go to rickhafley.com slash books or just really rickhafley.com. There's a bunch of information there. And, we, and I think we will try to put something together with you if it works out to um, dig in a little bit deeper because I really want to hear some of these um, you know maybe we could talk more about the clinics or, or just some online sessions the thing you did with Phil it was interesting because I didn't um, you know I know Phil I heard from Phil's perspective but talk about that a little bit how did you do the still water because that's one of those still the still water doesn't get as much press as the trout streams do you yeah, yeah it's yeah. a little bit different how did you cover that session so what I did with Phil was not just on lakes. It was lakes and streams, and it was about 10 hours of material that was spread over two and a half weeks. So we did two sessions a week, Tuesday and Thursday nights, uh, all online, Zoom online. And so we covered the major orders. So we covered the mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, diptera, dragonflies, damselflies, water boatmen, back swimmers. We kind of went through all the major orders. And it was really focused on learning to get better at identifying the different hatches in each of the orders. So we spent a lot of time really diving into identifying things at the level that anglers are most interested in and um, and then spent a fair bit of time on fly patterns for the different uh, hatches. And uh, 
some time on technique. I definitely got into rigging like leaders and stuff. And then there was plenty of time for questions and answers. So Phil and I were on all the sessions together. So we were both there. And so questions could come to either one of us. And, um, and the stream side of things was covered. Probably the majority of the material was on streams and not lakes. So, you know, when we got into dragonflies and damsels and chronomids, you know, that was focused on lakes, of course. But the mayflies, caddis, stoneflies was um, mostly stream-oriented information and hatches. So it wasn't it wasn't the lake program. It was really broad base of entomology coverage. Uh, uh, tried to hit hit everything we could, and like I say, it was about ten hours of material. So people had plenty of time to ask questions, and it worked really well. I mean, the Zoom thing works works surprisingly good for that sort of uh, program. Yeah, I think that's one of those things. You think we went through the COVID thing, and for all the bad things that happened with COVID, there's. Actually, some of the good was the, the Zoom. Like they they got all that online stuff, and it just made it easier for events like what you do and what we do too. Yeah, it's great actually. And I've given quite a few Zoom programs to fly clubs for their meetings. You know, they don't have to fly me to Ohio. I could sit in my office here and do a program in Ohio, and and they get the same information, and it's on Zoom, and it works great. Yeah, works great. That's that's awesome. And I'm I'm looking at some other stuff you have. Understanding Western hatches would be another yeah. one would, would be really cool. So basically you and Phil kind of went back and forth. You're like you covering both. Phil went into some of the still water stuff, but you talked about the bugs and you guys dug into yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. The identification stuff. I, you know, really focused on that. And then certainly for lake techniques, Phil's the master on that. He was he was there and covered that. So it it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a good turnout and uh I'm sure we'll be offering it again this winter. And Phil's so darn busy, he, he has a lot going on. All I know. I know. Sometimes with Phil, I've because we're doing these pot. he's doing, uh, I think we're trying to get 10 or uh, you know, a podcast a month in with him. Yeah. And, and so, it, it, yeah, he's a busy guy, but yeah. he's, he's great. Yeah. He's fun to work with and he knows what he's talking about. Nice. So, yeah. so one thing, you know, and this is kind of high level stuff, but it's been coming up quite a bit just, and you mentioned it yourself, you know, fires, water temperatures. I mean, we're seeing, you know, climate change. It's yeah. obvious, you know, we're seeing changes and things are going on. What's your take? I mean, how does that affect bugs? I mean, we talked about the DRA stuff, but yeah. you know, throughout the whole country, you see it affecting fish. People saying, I've had guests on that said, Hey, brook trout are going to be going away. You know what I mean? Like being straight up, it's like things are changing. But what's your take on bugs? You see, are you seeing these changes? Well, you know, I, I this is an important topic, and part of me feels like it's a big downer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and so I, I kind of, you know, have the vow. But nonetheless, it's important. I, I think there's a lot going on actually, uh, and water temperatures it triggers a lot of stuff. So water temperatures are obviously becoming warmer. Periods. We're getting really different kinds of less water in streams as well. Even like this year was a really good snowpack. And I think Montana's having some pretty good amount of water in rivers this year. But but here in Oregon, even though we had a big snowpack, rivers are really low. Right? Yeah, they're low. Uh, so even when we have decent winter conditions, our summer flows tend to be lower than they used to be, which adds to the effect of warmer air and warms the rivers up more because there's less water. And then when you have warmer conditions, you also have the likelihood of having greater algal blooms and you get nuisance algal growths and that triggers other changes in food conditions in the streams that are not as beneficial for insects. So there's a whole chain of events that temperature can trigger. Uh, So I I think the thing we just need to do is really be as anglers and concern folks over climate and, and streams is do what we can to minimize the impacts. So make sure, you know, streams have a good riparian habitat and not allow grazing along the banks of streams. That's always been, you know, something to avoid. Uh, but whatever we can do to benefit the habitat of streams, uh, water use. So whatever we can do to conserve water, get better irrigation systems and ag communities in line and, protect the streams as best we can, do what we can to minimize our carbon footprint. 
I mean, that's, I think all we can do is try to maintain the best habitat conditions we can out there and minimize water use. So, but it's, it's happening. I mean, there's no question about it. Yeah. Yeah. We're seeing changes that says, so I, yeah. And the steelhead is another good one. We've talked about quite a bit where we've seen some big changes in steelhead populations around and, you know, not quite sure what's going on. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on, but, uh, yeah, I think we'll save that for maybe another conversation and, uh, and maybe just talk about here as we wrap this up, Rick, I mean, we've, we've talked about a number of different resources. If somebody here is getting ready back to that trip, you know, they're planning their trip out to Montana, you know, that first step, it sounds like, what would you say, what would be your one tip for them if they're getting ready and they want to learn more about the bugs in that area? Where, where, where do you, what do you leave them with here today? Well, you know, I, I guess I'd say if you're going on a trip, definitely the local fly shops are going to know the most about what's currently going on with the bug hatches. So contact them in the area when you get there or by phone or whatever you want to do, however you do it ahead of time, <laughs> find out what they've got going in terms of what's happening with the insect hatches. And then when you get out there, just prepared to look, look around on your own, you know, observe what's happening because it's going to change throughout the day and it's not going to just be what they tell you it's going on. It's always a little different, but the local fly shops are going to be dialed into the most co- current and best, you know, kind of activity that's happening. Yeah, you know, for sure. Perfect. And what is the, you know, just a couple of quick ones as we get out of here. When you're doing your, you know, your events, your clinics, is there a common question you get? What, what do you think if you had to say, is there one common question you get all the time in all these events or there may be the one you did with Phil? Well, I, th- I think the most common thing is, or one of the common things is, is uh, comments. It may it's not a question is like, oh man, I didn't realize these critters were so small. You know, yeah. When you start looking at them firsthand, and the other one is, you know, they, they just didn't realize there was such diversity out there. And when you see the diversity firsthand, you go, wow, you know, this is really a rich ecosystem, lots going on, but it's not that complicated when you look at it from an angler's point of view to come up with, you know, like I said, I've got 15 fly patterns in my, my uh, little pamphlet on my favorite fly patterns. And frankly, those will cover 80% of the situations you run into, you know, so not that those are the only ones that work. There's variations of those that every, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of variations. And it's just the styles, uh, certain styles you can alter however you want. But if you have certain styles of patterns and certain sizes, you're going to cover 80% of the stuff you need to be you're likely to run in. So, you know, it, it's not crazy complicated, but there is a lot of there is a lot of variables out there. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Good. And, and what about on the music? Are you still playing? I know you had the band. Are you still playing music out there? Oh uh, yeah, I'm playing. I'm playing quite a bit actually. I'm still playing in a couple of blues bands. It's actually been a busy summer. COVID is kind of behind us. There's a lot more live music going on. So I've got three gigs coming up in the next week and a half. So oh wow, where where, yeah. where are you playing? Where like where, what type of gigs? Well, I'm playing actually this coming Sunday at Tualatin. Bird Sanctuary Festival. Oh, wow. And then I'm playing at a McMinimins uh, restaurant in Wilsonville after that. And then I'm playing in Beaverton. I can't remember where. After. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And if people want to listen, is there, how could we listen to a song? Is there a place we can check you out? Go on to uh, my website. And one of the things people can buy is m- the one CD I have out called Howling. Oh, nice. Howling Trout's available. It's all original music from a band I was in a long time ago. That band doesn't exist anymore. The name of the band was Howling Trout, and we just had one CD. But if you go on uh, YouTube and type in Bridge City Blues Band, you'll get our current band that's playing local stuff that's been recorded and put up on YouTube. Oh, okay. So that's Bridge City Blues Band. Bridge City Blues. And you play the drums, right? I'm on the drums. Yeah. Yeah. The drums. There you go. Okay. Perfect. So we'll, we'll put some music <laughs> in the show notes as we head out of here. And uh, yeah. yeah, Rick, this has been great. I think what we'll do is maybe get you back on sooner than five years so we can dig in more into more of these topics. Because I think, you know, we talked about it. Stoneflies, we didn't really cover. You know, yeah. there's a lot of stuff we didn't cover. We hit the surface today. So yeah. So, yeah. But I appreciate all the information that you, you, you know, put out there and we'll definitely be in touch with you. And thanks again for coming on. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. That is a wrap. You can grab all of the show notes at wetflyswing.com. And please follow us on Instagram and share this episode out with someone you love. 
please send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com if you have any feedback or want us to put together an episode on this podcast for you. Check in anytime. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and would love to meet up with you on the water. We have new fly fishing schools going all year long and all around the country. So if you want to connect, let's do it right now. All right, time to get out of here. I hope you have a great evening. I hope you have a great morning or great afternoon wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you for stopping by and checking out the show today. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. 